My name is Mary, Mary McMullen, um, and this evening we're going to be talking about staying safe in the moment. And by the moment, we mean when things get really challenging for one of your children. I'm assuming we have mostly parents. Um, if there are educators here too, then one of your students. Um, uh, okay, so you can go to the next slide. So just, I, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna spend the time talking about me, but just quickly, I was a former teacher of kids on the spectrum, and now I work as a consultant um, uh, in schools and with families and do professional development. And um, as we were talking before we went um, on the air with everybody, is I prefer to make this format, particularly around this topic, um, a, a conversation and not a lecture. So the slides will not reflect um, enormous detail around, around a million strategies. We're really going to stick to this idea of problem solving, what we can do as sort of a prevention to have in place some things, and then literally some things we might try in the moment. One of the things I want you to keep in mind, um, however, is, um, so I'd like this to be a conversation um, and share your thoughts and comments questions for sure as we go along. Uh, this can't be prescriptive for each particular kid. However, you know that when we talk about behaviors that are challenging, but hopefully you will still get some ideas and some process um, and share ideas that you've used um, uh, for others that are here. Okay, so that's our goal slide. So just a few thoughts to kind of set us up. Um, you know, I talk about this topic a lot about how to support people on the spectrum, autistic people, um, when they're really struggling all the time. But in this particular moment, obviously, we're dealing with just unimaginable change for all of us. And we know a lot of the people that we're supporting and living with and loving are particularly challenged by change. So it has really thrown a big, big, big um, uh, barrier um, for, for many of the folks that we're working with. So um, anybody want to share just how are your children doing okay now? Are they mostly good days, more bad days than good days, or still kind of some of the some of both? Anybody want to add anything about where your current status is? If not, I'll just keep going. I don't know if you can see, um, you can let me know. Mary, I'll let you know as soon as okay, any questions good. or answers or uh, chat comes Thank in. Thank you. Um, so behaviors that are challenging offer um, trigger us <laughs> uh, to create really big emotions as well. Some of that comes from our own history. Some of that comes from the way we've been trained. Some of that comes from our own temperament. I'm not going to go into a, a, a big therapy session here, but there, there are ways that we respond um, based on all of those factors, um, and particularly uh, around the idea that we just want it to stop, and we want it to stop quickly because we feel so horrible for, the, for the, our child or for our student, that we just want to get in there and make it stop. And most often, we're not able to do that with a simple directive or a simple command. If we're able to do that, we don't need this conversation. Those aren't usually the, if we're able to do that, then we're fine, we move on. And then we work on figuring out the underlying things so we can prevent and give alternatives and teach new behaviors. But when we're dealing with really, really, really uh, big emotions, um, just asking somebody to stop is generally, obviously, you all know, not going to be super helpful. Maybe in a novel situation. I remember one time when I was working with the, actually a behavior analyst that trained me, Gary Lavinia, who was out of Chicago. Um, uh, he, uh, he taught me that in, in a, one of the strategies in a very dangerous situation is literally to use kind of slapstick humor. So maybe like pretend that you're tripping and falling in a really, really dramatic way, 
And sometimes that just sort of shocks uh, the person to just stop for the moment so you can get people safe and move on. But generally that's not, we don't get things to happen that quickly. And then we have one. Sure, um, one comment. One comment in for the uh, changes is, my kiddo is having trouble dealing with the lack of routine. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I can certainly appreciate that. And we're going to be talking a little bit about, um, about that. And I'm not going to just say, we'll create a routine. That's, that's kind of like, say, tell them to knock it off. <laughs> tell them to stop. It's, I, know, I know it's bigger than that. So thanks for that. And I'll make sure I speak more directly to that as we move on. But then going back to that idea of, you know, these really big challenges and often more threatening, scarier, dangerous kind of behavior. Um, put us in this kind of often a moment, moment of panic and we, do, and we need to work really hard ourselves to see if we can shift and kind of expand um, our perspective of what might be going on for that kiddo at that time. So and Mary, if, I, if I can add one thing just as, yeah, a, absolutely. as a parent of seven uh, with five neurotypical, um, I know that even, you know, when they're little kids, everyone knows this, every parent knows, when a kid falls, they're looking to you for an emotional yeah. cue on how to right. react. So in these bigger moments, I found, and you know, in some family tragedies or some really awful pieces of news, I've found that if I can keep my spirits up, if I can even use some gallows humor, um, sometimes if I'm not showing that the whole world is falling apart, then the children are gonna not, think so either. It gives them a level of comfort that, hey, we're safe enough that you can make a joke. Um, so again, yeah, that's absolutely. A, yeah, that's a really nice setup because we go into both of those, uh, two of those examples as we move on. So, so thank you for that, Brian. That is, that is really helpful. Um, so, so, and in relation to that, again, we're looking at what might that behavior mean Again, we're not able to do a full analysis here, but we do know that's our ultimate goal is trying to figure out the why. Um, so if you could move to the next slide, um, Nicholas, that would be great. And I focused here not on every possible why, but those, the many of the whys that are particularly relevant for these big changes that are going on right now. Uh, most of us, if we are, are honest, are super anxious. And a lot of the, the uh, autistic people we support are sort of hardwired to be at a really high level of anxiety on a good day and without a pandemic. So that has really multiplied and magnified the anxiety in, in a lot of our folks. A lot of them are expressing a lot of anger and madness and, and being really mad about all of the changes and about all of the disappointment. And, and Brian was talking about his typically developing kids too, and that's true of all kids. I have a nephew who's uh, going off to college and he is really mad that they might only have only online learning and he's going to the East Coast. Um, you know, his, his college experience is gonna be very, very different at least to start. So all of that is, a lot of a lot of us and a lot of our kids are really tired more so than usual this is really exhausting this the, taking on all of this change and all of these unknowns and all of the the fear that's around them some of them are super excited when anything happens that might be like you know grandma's stopping over and she's going to put some cookies on the i was talking to a parent the other night and grandma was putting cookies on the front porch. And this, this nine-year-old was beside himself with excitement and he ended up in a meltdown. And mom felt just terrible that there's one moment of excitement for him. But a lot of, a lot of our um, folks on the spectrum, uh, even positive emotions are, can be very, very, very exaggerated. That's something that I learned primarily from people who have autism people who are autistic, um, who uh, we often would misread um, what looked like disappointment because they didn't react in the happy-go-lucky way that we are expecting of them. Actually, a very good friend of mine who has autism, I remember the first time we exchanged Christmas 
gifts. She has spent a couple of days um, overnight with us. And I remember her telling me it, but it didn't register till it happened. She had um, little to no typical reaction or excitement about the gift, even though I know it was something she very much liked. And she went up to the room and left it on the table and didn't take it. Um, and the next day, she's quite verbal. The next day, she was ex able to explain to me that she was overwhelmed with, with um, happiness and gratitude and excitement. And it just kind of put her over the edge in the same way some of the other more negative emotions. So we kind of, I think that's important in general to keep in mind for our kids who have some explosive behavior that might be tied. So, and a lot of our kids are just very confused. You can go to the next slide. And Mary, one thing though, yeah. is, as much as they have sometimes an exaggerated emotional reaction, my son, Max, um, was the opposite. He's probably the most even keeled kid. So, so reading his emotions is sometimes tough because, you know, the, it, it, it could be crazy, wild, great things happening. And it's just calm and still water or, or horrible things happen. You just can't read them very well. Yeah, that's a real, that's really important because sometimes that kind of what we're describing as, as a, you know, a really bad moment is kind of a pretty major shutdown. Yes. And yep. that's very difficult right, as well, right? That's equally, uh, it's not harmful, but it's equally difficult because you're not engaged and you're not supporting because you're not um, oh, yeah. either maybe interpreting it right or figuring out the right strategies yet. I remember a mom uh, describing to me as I watched her little guy um, with um, uh, bubbles. Um, and uh, he looked, again, in, in a, this was really early on in my teaching, so I'd like to think I learned a whole lot more <laughs> since then, but um, he looked really distressed and not very excited and happy. And I had just met him about five minutes before them. And she looked over and I said to her, you let you help me understand since he's new to me when you'd like us to stop because I certainly don't want him to be upset. She said, I've rarely seen him this excited. And that excited was he didn't disengage from it. So that was a really important um, marker, that subtlety, that subtlety that we saw. So reading and interpreting and understanding what emotion might be going on that that is associated with that um, difficult moment, um, obviously is something we do ongoing. We're always thinking about it, um, but this is, these are pretty big ones that are happening now. A lot of disappointment, a lot of our kids are bored. Even though we're trying to get them to do things, um, we think, you know, we're trying to help with the boredom because it's out of routine, because it's not uh, what they typically do. It's harder to try new things, it's harder to be in a different schedule. Um, but at the same time, they're bored. Um, they're kind of scared. They're very frustrated. A lot of, like I said, a lot of disappointment. So obviously we're going to ask that why and do our best to try and figure it out as we're over time um, looking at this behavior. So, next slide, please. So I, I think I've tried to say this already, but uh, you, what you didn't notice on, on just some of those descriptions of possible emotions, it, it doesn't say he's doing it just to make you mad. Because that's really obviously not the case, but in the moment, it might feel like that. It might feel like, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're just trying to get my goal. Or they're just trying to mess everything up that I just started out. They just want to make me mad. This isn't about criticism or blaming, but I'd like to, if you haven't thought about it differently, I'd like you to consider um, taking that off your list because that's rarely that intention, um, rarely if ever that intention is behind what's going on for them, particularly if they're at the point of a meltdown. Nobody wants to be um, in a meltdown just to make you mad, believe me. And, and while we're not doing a full functional analysis, we're continuing to keep trying to figure out, like we were talking about the, the emotions and do some problem solving and thinking ahead. It's hard to think about, can you be a prepared for an unexpected in the moment? Yeah, you can on some level, if you've thought through some of the, the processes, and I'm sure many of you have, that we'll, that we'll continue to talk about tonight. 
So it's about supporting and not about just getting that compliance. That's another sort of trigger. I work with a lot of teachers um, and no offense, because I was a teacher too, but a lot of times they get in their mindset that what's required is compliance and I'm gonna do what I need to do to get them to comply. At that moment in time, that's probably the least, the least important thing we're looking for. Next slide, slide please. So we're gonna talk about supports and prevention, even though the title says we're gonna talk about in the moment, because you'll see, um, and I'm sure in many of your experiences that if we have a little, some of those things in place or if we're working on getting them in place under these new circumstances, which look a bit different, those are part of what we can use at lower levels of agitation and frustration on the point of, of many of our kids. So support in, from a prevention standpoint, as well as in the moment. Next slide, please. So obviously we're gonna start with the, the prevention. So schedules and routines. Next slide, thank you. Um, in particular, um, I didn't, I, I was saying to Emily at the beginning, so many of the resources are being um, repeated and they're excellent ones and families and school personnel are, are telling me too, more is not better at this point. <laughs> they don't have time to get through everything. But I'm gonna reference, um, a webinar that was done in early April, um, filling the day. Was that, was that what, it, what was it called, Emily? Do you remember? Keeping kids know. busy at home. Keeping oh, kids busy at home is is basically extensive resources. So I was I would reference you back. All the visual schedule stuff is there. The timers are there. The movement. There's tons of resources related to these kinds of things, um, as well as I'm sure others that you have. So one of the things that families and school staff are telling me is that we know they don't have their same routine, they don't have their same schedule, but still some version of a schedule, because we know how important predictability is and decreasing anxiety, it's worth trying to scrape together some version even if it only lasts five minutes, just kind of keep plugging away at some version of it. And many families have uh, told me in, in my attempt to try and help teachers and staff put this together is that it's almost been easier for the kids at home, and that's where they all are, is to have a family schedule and not a school schedule because they're not doing school all day. Yeah, actually, most of them are break now, but when they were, more of what's happening it's what goes on with the family. So school gets embedded in the family schedule. That's also helping a bit with our kids who are very confused about doing school at home, right? That's not what they're typically used to. So if we have a family schedule rather than just, now if the child, obviously everything, if you know something that the kid wants that they want their own schedule, you can superimpose that in the family one, that, that's fine. But the kids who are having more trouble separating those two things out, it's been a little bit easier to kind of combine it together. Um, and I'm talking about a loose schedule. So wake up, have breakfast, activities at the table. So for some kids, we're not even using the word school because that's a trigger that's, that's you know, then we have all these discussions around how they're really not at school. Um, it may or may not involve a computer, depending on where our kids are at, are sick of that or still like that. So we start out with a schedule, getting as much input from this child as we learn more about what they prefer. And then, then that's linear and not necessarily time-based. So things show up in a list, but we don't necessarily have specific times around them. If there are certain things that have to have a time, like a Zoom classroom meeting, then we'll put that on. Otherwise, we're finding that that is triggering more anxiety again and stress because it isn't as predictable. It doesn't end up following those time schedules as much because of all that variability. Does that make sense? It's different than um, what you would typically just do with the family or just do at school. 
but keeping it a little bit more open-ended seems, believe it or not, seems to be a bit more helpful for uh, a lot of our kids. So that may be a linear list. It may be accompanied by pictures. Um, for some of our, um, I'm finding, well, some little ones too, but more of the adolescents and young adults, what we're using is literally post-its that we put in no order. We just slap them on a, on a piece of paper. One kid actually has them on the side of the refrigerator. Um, and these are all the suggestions we have, none of which have to be done in a particular order. But the, like we want, we, we're suggesting some outside things. We're suggesting um, you know, some sensory time. We're suggesting some time on the computer. But, but that is easing, uh, easing it into um, some predictability for some of our folks who don't, uh, who don't want to address it, who don't want to even delve into it if it looks like it's not going to be how they expect it to be. So it's a little bit more open-ended. And then as those things happen, uh, they come off. If they want to do some things more than once, then we duplicate the, that particular thing on the poster or on the board or, um, like I said, for one of my friends on the side of the refrigerator. He's figured out that he thinks he gets more snacks if he has more access. To <laughs> he might. I don't know. I'm not sure. It's just you know, I, I, I haven't really thought about spots. it. Oh, we have a question, by the way. Do you have time limits on the activities? 30 minutes on computer, for instance? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I had said don't put time limits on everything because it seems like we're not being able to stick to them. And then that causes more challenge with the exception of some things that have to happen at a certain time. And I would suggest that things that you only want or you're really working on some definitive um, beginning and end to as well. And that might be that might be screen time for some of our folks who are really struggling to manage any way of monitoring that, self-monitoring that. So yes, I would put that that kind of thing. I would try. You may not always be successful, but I would try um, putting a, a time frame on that. Have you seen any kind of a visual way? to kind of show this, these linear things that could happen, but that there's a ambiguity in when, that the child knows that, that you know, we will have breakfast and then you'll get to do something and then we'll have lunch and then we'll have dinner. Um, well, but maybe some visual sense of not now. Yes, the, the, and the way I've done that actually is this disordered schedule. That is just like a menu that has pictures all over it, but not in any particular order. Okay. And then we have a, then we have a blank, list with spots on it and as those things come up we just move it over to that yeah, so, so these things could really happen fun. they might happen we'd like them to happen and when they do we'll put it over here on the other schedule so visually it's not a promise it's simply a menu exactly yeah and that where that's where that's been helpful for a lot of um a lot of children with families and with school staff that I'm working with is kids will ask for things. And we don't want to say no to everything. We don't want to deny everything, especially our kids who have really challenging communication systems. And they think every time we say, oh, I'm not sure, they think we haven't understood what they said. Right. And that's where some of this explosiveness is happening. We're like, ah, I got it. You said park. Thank you. We're going to put that over here. We're going to put that on the menu here. We're going to put that on this. We don't even call it a list. We're going to put it on your board. We're going to put it on today's board. And then if it stops raining, we don't go through all that. But if there's an opportunity, then we can put it on the actual schedule. Does that make sense? Is that clear or not clear? It makes Linear? sense to me. OK. You can't hear us nodding. I know. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. <laughs> yeah, this is um, this is very different, and in some ways, um, of course, the eternal optimist in me is always trying to figure out what we're gaining that's good about this. <laughs> um, and in some ways, while we're saying this predictability is really important, and the schedule and the routine is still very important, 
we're figuring out ways to negotiate around things and convey more change and variability that I'm hoping over time we can keep in, not this level of open-endedness, obviously, but some pieces of that that I think will help them not get as stuck. I'm hopeful it will help them not get quite as stuck in some of the ways that they they had been before. And then, Mary, we had a follow-up to the time yeah. limits of what if my kid perseverates on a single activity? Well, one of the ways, and that's really common, and one of the ways, um, and this is not a quick fix. None of these are quick fixes. They're process, right? So one of the ways we've done that, again, is we've put that same activity on the menu multiple times. So there's four or three post-its that say that particular activity. So they do in fact get to do it more times. So they're, what we're finding is some of them are willing to stop and make a new choice when they know it's on there again. So we're at least intermittently getting other things versus eight hours on the same game. Let me know if that answered it or, or not. It also is kind of uh, built into, um, or for some of our ki kids, um, we're using the simple first then. Now, first then doesn't mean always first do this and you get a particular reward. First then might be first you do this and then I'm going to leave you alone. <laughs> then you just get to go and do your own thing, um, which actually for many of our our kids is a reward. Um, now, including them in the development of that schedule, again, that's where if we have this open-ended menu, we can put all kinds of things on there. And they'll learn over time that they may or may not happen that day, or they may not happen until the afternoon, or they may happen the next day. It's kind of like the idea of a shopping list for this is happening more and more as the kids are home, uh, you know, all these long hours is um, they'll ask for something and one of their siblings ate the last fruity pebbles and they didn't know about that. Um, and mom said, yes, you can have them. And then they go to the cupboard and they're not there. So yes, you can have them. You can't have them now, but we'll put them on the shopping list that we put on the side of the refrigerator. So I didn't say no, never. I said, when we get some more from the list and then over time, kids are able to understand that and stay a little calmer because then it comes off of the list when we have it back from the store and put it on the shelf. So we're building the visuals and the transitions into them helping me understanding this in a big picture way, which again, I think is um, long-term gonna be more beneficial for them, right? Okay, next slide, please. So some kind of routine schedule and part of that, um, and this is where I'm not going to go into each of uh, a whole presentation on this because this is several in and of itself, but some version of regulation, whatever it is for that kid, um, some version of mindfulness or relaxation or yoga or breathing and some version of movement. And for some kids, all of those are under, under one category, but the schedule should include something about this because we're not going to move along that continuum unless we can we know this we know about social emotional learning but we but it's equally important families know in their home and in particular i have one young man who's literally doing one of these activities every other activity now they only last a few minutes but he's doing them every other activity and interesting that came from this build your own schedule, because he kept picking, he, he kept picking first um, sensory um, toys and materials, but then he started picking the uh, breathing app um, on his iPad that I think the initial attraction was um, like bells and whistles. There was a lot of movement to it. And then interest, he, as he's working on this breathing, his mom told me last week that he dropped out the app, that now he in fact can do it and doesn't even go and get it. But that's what sort of enticed him. But still, every other activity includes something, um, uh, some kind of regulation for him. So prevention, we've got routine, schedule, regulation, mindfulness. Next slide, please. 
And the, th and the third thing, I think I, I, I know I heard you say this, Brian, so I'll just reiterate it really quickly. This comes from the wholehearted um, uh, counseling. Um, this is not mine. I wish it was my idea, but it, it's not mine. But we initially, I think we're trying to promise kids things because we're just so hopeful things would change and get better. And yeah, we're going to go back to school and yeah, we're going to see grandma. And now we just don't know. So just like a social story, you have to be authentic and honest, but I also don't want to beat you into the ground. Like, like, like Brian said, I don't want it to be all negative and I want to model for you that I get that it's challenging, but there are, there are, you know, I can reassure you that, um, you know, I'm here and I've got your back and I don't know what will happen or when, but this will end. There will be an end to this. It won't last forever. It's totally normal to be worried and sad and disappointed. So let's, um, let's talk about how we can uh, do good and kind things and have good feelings as well. A, a simple um, kind of really almost a childlike strategy that's working or many adults I know, is the kindness jar um, it, or the compliment jar or the caring jar um, because it gets a little obnoxious if you keep saying all of these things, but we can put a note in, in the jar and we can pull one out. Um, or kids who, who kids don't like to get a lot of praise or don't like to be told they did a good job all the time and, it, and kind of find that a little bit obnoxious. We can put some of those reassurances and those positive kinds of affirmations in a jar or on the um, in that more subtle way for those more subtle kids we can put it on their bed or we can put it uh, um, next to their desk or next to their their game board or whatever it is that they're using so just examples of this is really hard but um, I know we can deal with it we can get through together so don't pretend it's not going on um, but offer some and I, I'm, I imagine you are doing this it gets to be exhausting. And a few more examples on the next slide, um, Nicholas, um, they put out another one. So I'm here to support you no matter what, let's figure out a solution. I use that phrase a lot, not just in this prevention section, but in particular, as a meltdown is building, almost the only words I will ever say out loud to kids are, we will figure this out. We can do this together because I wanna take the responsibility off them as that you're bad and you're in trouble and you gotta, you gotta knock it off and you gotta come down. You got all of that. I want them to know that we're gonna do this together. Um, you don't have to tell me how to fix it. We'll figure it out together. Cause we often go there cause we want to enlist them. We want to understand, but when they're too far gone, that's not when they're too upset, when they're too distressed. Um, it's hard for them to talk about it then. So I know you're upset and when you're ready that we can talk about it later. I'm still here, that kind of thing. Okay, next slide, please. I'm taking too long. Okay, another part of the prevention and the responsive strategy when things are starting to go south is that safe space. Boy, that's hard in classrooms and it's really hard in homes because you can't just keep a single space for a kid, but try your best to find a tiny spot that they can go to and, and that you can direct them to that has some of these things, favorite toys, favorite books, um, sensory toys, softer hearts, uh, soft cushions, or one of, one of the kids uh, that I'm working with um, likes hard puzzles because that's the stem that he prefers. This is not, um, you earn this, none of this is earned, this is a space that you can go to just feel okay or to begin to calm down. When, Have you seen any creative solutions for people with limited space or limited means? Uh, yeah, um, good old fashioned tents made out of two chairs and a blanket. Yep. Literally. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. Um, under, under the stairs in the basements. <laughs> Yep. Of, of family sent me the other day. Um, a a four-year-old is under the cocktail table that they push to the side of the wall because they and literally it, don't have another space. You know, Mary, the uh, people may know this, but uh, you can get sheets and blankets that are ugly but work uh, at any Goodwill or any exactly. thrift store for yeah. a buck sometimes. So if you don't, you don't want to- care if they get stuck under their furniture and get torn or right. yeah, yeah, right. exactly. 
or somebody decides to have tug of war with it. And then we'll find one with boy. avocado green flower arrangements or something that somebody. Right. <laughs> and you know, then there's less stress on that as well, because if you're using the sheets that you just bought, you, it's going to be harder, you know, you can't replace them because you lost your job and, and all yeah. of those things multiply. So, so nobody's get, building a new house. I mean, it's literally finding a tiny spot. Yep. Not easy, but no. certainly possible if you know, if you know that your kid likes to be number one under things um, and not be seen by everybody. Um, uh, or is just going to get overwhelmed, particularly about around the other siblings um, that that are in that space. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. So, do our best to anticipate. Obviously, that's part of that understanding the emotion um, and decreasing that intensity. Uh, where we can still prevent the big blow up. So offer help, we can do this together, offer choice. If, if that child is too distressed, choice is not going to be helpful. Does that make sense? If you're too stressed out to, to make a choice, it's going to be more helpful to not say, do you want to go to your safe space? Instead, you're going to say, go to your safe space. But if they're able at still at the point of where they can make a choice, obviously visual visually would be easier. Offer an acceptable way to say no. So in this moment, that might be screaming at you. And I'm probably not going to say uh, use an inside voice and don't yell at your mother. If if he screams no, and I and I understand that he really means no, thank you for telling me. And we're going to stop this and put it away. And we're going to come back to that. It's off the schedule now. That's not what we want long term. None of this is what we long, what want long term. This is about a solution in the moment of a very, very, very stressful adult and very stressed out child or adult, young adult. Please don't ask questions at this point either. Actually, I heard Emily say the other day, asking questions was never helpful for Sam. Um, maybe I shouldn't disclose that. Sorry, Sam. Um, questions were stressful for him. Yeah. If, yeah. if people, like most adults, if they go into uh, meeting a new child, they'll ask some questions like, oh, what do you like to do? What grade are you in? How old are you? What's your favorite color? What do you want to be when you grow up? And he could not do questions. But if you could say something like, oh, I like what you're doing with your blocks or, um, oh, it looks like you really like red. Exactly. <laughs> something like that. Exactly. It, was, yeah. it was a way of, a, of inviting him in and making a comment, which, he, which didn't stress him out. And you can have a whole conversation not asking questions, believe it or not. <laughs> you can have a whole conversation. Uh, but I think that's, again, sort of our nervousness. Um, uh, okay, next slide, please. I'm realizing it's getting quite late here. Um, so all of those, having said all of those things that we're all ongoing working on with maybe a few variations um, uh, and, and different ways of approaching them that we talked about, um, in that moment where we're beyond that or it's getting, it's getting to the point where um, where we have a kid who's going to be out of control soon is first again try and figure out like Brian said too is our kids are going to mirror our responses and interestingly even if they don't if even if we don't observe that if we don't see it get more intense internally it absolutely is and those are some of the kids who then shut down um, or we're building and building and building on that layer on that five point scale and, and it's gonna come really quick. So try to breathe, try to be quiet, um, quiet our voice when we talk softer, um, we get more quiet, slow down our body um, and, and try and uh, mirror what it is we would like them to do or at least not make it worse. They may not be able to model that, but probably we're not gonna make it worse because we don't wanna enter more of that chaos we wanna try and offer some support. At this early stage, this is also where I might say, we can figure this out. We, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll find a solution. 
it, I don't say it'll be okay. And I don't, I don't ever say calm down. Because how would you feel if you were at this point and somebody said to you, calm down? That would be really hard. Or to say you're okay, but we know you're not okay. I might in fact say, it looks like you're not okay. We can figure this out. Next slide, please. So let's be honest, like I said at the beginning, we're not gonna go just command this to stop. Um, uh, we, all, we all need to, uh, it's not a battle of the wills at this point and nobody needs to win. We just all need to get her to a place where we can regroup and recover and, and get and be in, internally in a calmer state. Back away, if we need to be in sight and even in arm's reach, we can still back away to be within arm's reach. Sort of overpowering somebody. Now, again, I'm not talking about serious danger or safety here. This is not a forum that we can do that. So you know your own child. And if you need to do something to keep them from hurting themselves, of course you're gonna do that. If, you're, if you don't need to do that, then it's always better to not touch and try and back away because those moments might allow you some more space and time for that child to regroup or that adult to regroup. So often our kids get overwhelmed by a lot of movement and not just sound. So the more still we can stay as well, if we can, if we're able to do that. And sometimes a new person entering quietly and, and the person who is in the interaction, again, no guilt, no judgment. Sometimes that's, that it's actually a behavioral technique. A stimulus change sometimes helps decrease the intensity if a new person walks in. We use it in schools as well. But not chatting and not asking questions and usually getting down at a, um, a sitting level if possible and not a standing over level. Next slide, please. So at this point, the brain is not able to learn new information. It's literally in a state of survival. So again, I'm not gonna ask how you're feeling. I'm gonna say, I can see this is really hard for you. I can see you're struggling. I can see you're sad. I might try some distraction. And this is tricky, those, those of us who are trained also as behaviorists, um, although I almost never use those kinds of things in this context. The distraction for you to sort of shift you might be one of your special interests. Now you gotta get out of your head that what I'm doing is reinforcing that behavior because I go to, to the top of that slide, it says new learning is not happening right now. Okay, so if they have the point of no, no return, I'm just trying to shift them to get them back to a decelerated, the point where they can start to deescalate and regulate. It's not about reinforcing them. With their, with their special interests. It's about engaging them. Just like we do in, in discrete trial, we'll go back to a, a rapid, well-known uh, um, instructional cue, try and shift them back. We mentioned unexpected humor, and sometimes slapstick. Sometimes I will suggest um, to have, if possible, um, if you are concerned about moving somebody to a safe space or to, or to a, a like it away from the front of the door, away from the stove or something that's gonna be more dangerous is to have access on that day at that point where it starts to get more, more um, acceleration, maybe some large pills or an old bean bag that you don't use anymore that you can sort of grab and use as a bit of a barrier to help that. Because our kids, again, don't wanna hurt anyone. They don't wanna hurt themselves. They need support to sort of manage that in the moment. If they're able to, again, uh, uh, attend to a visual system, a, a quick menu, a high need board, um, probably not their whole PEX board, but uh, uh, you know, particular things that help, um, you know, sensory things, movement things that help um, access to their safe space, or just offer them that visual of that one thing that, you know, generally is going to help more. Next slide, please. So I mentioned before, don't ask them to calm down. 
or don't say that they're, oh, I guess, yeah. When, what I might say is I can help you calm down. Let's figure out some ways to calm down, right? That's very, very different. And people think, people think that our kids who have more significant challenges don't get that distinction. They absolutely do get that distinction. I don't think they get our tone because our tone is different when we say it in a different way. I may reference, um, I call it a happy place. But again, that's something that we know like their special interest is as in the past and routinely at the moment makes them happy. One of the things that's working beautifully for this 12 year old who has had some really significant challenges in his home, um, he's used to having his grandparents around a lot and they're not. They made the sweetest, dearest video clip of them singing to him that mom doesn't even have to have in front of him. She can just turn it on and it's on her phone. It's also on uh, several other devices, but she can just put that on and he, it really helps him shift. Doesn't stop it completely, but again, we're talking about de-escalating. So some of our other strategies can be helpful. Some of our other prevention strategies. A single phrase or, or a, almost a, um, a chant or a mantra, um, I, I can tell you're slowing down. You're working really hard. You're doing a. You're 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 starting to calm down. Um, offer time to recover for some of our, for some of our students and our children. It takes them a very long time. I'm talking some of them hours. Some of them might go take a two hour nap, in order to really recover and regroup. If it looks like they're starting to be okay and it keeps bubbling up we may be haven't given them enough time to recover. Praise them for getting it back together, um, not for um, just the, for working on it, not for just the success. Well, you are really, really, really trying. I can see that. So we don't just reward the ultimate end point, but all of these points along the way because we can't go from zero to 100 to get back and then 100 back to zero, we have to reinforce smaller increments of that and, and recognize, help them be aware that we recognize that they're, they're really working on that. Next slide, please. So here's one of my favorite slides. This, the Emily will like this. So questions aren't connections, questions can increase that anxiety and just some big, some more ways to sort of show um, that variation. Next slide, please. And then finally, again, the, um, there are lots and lots and lots of resources now that have been posted at the Autism Society, but I just put three here that, that are particularly focused, um, uh, focused on the, um, on the, the positive behavior support and really big behavior that we're, that we're kind of talking about. Um, I put Amy Lawrence's um, uh, TED talk on there, uh, uh, rethinking support for people that compliance is not necessarily our goal. It's not real long, but it's just beautifully done. And obviously as an OT, it's very much sensory based. She also has several adults with, who are autistic who are part of that talk. Um, and then Ross Green, if you're not familiar with him, I think he came up in some of the other talks. His site is Lives in the Balance. And one of the things I like particularly about this site is he has a lot of video clips for made for families and not just school issues, but family issues that are very, very family friendly and very have the same kind of positive approach to them. The O'Cali site in Ohio also has a really nice um, subset of family uh, talks and video clips, and particularly a bunch that they've added. Um, they're all about supporting autism um, uh, that they've added uh, during this um, uh, during this pandemic. And then the last slide um, is uh, I won't tell you to calm down, but I will I will remind you to take a deep breath because <laughs> that 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 it always helps, even just for the moment. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry that I went uh, longer, Emily. I went even went longer than the 35 minutes. Um, so uh, let's see what, I think I saw somebody else in the chat. We had a comment or a question. 
I had just posted um, all three of those links. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, one thing that I just wanted to mention is um, how humiliating these losses of control can be. Yeah. And how important it is, how important it was for, for my son to have everybody have a plan of where to go. Because not only is could he potentially lash out and hurt someone else or hurt himself, but he didn't want people to see him like that. He would, yeah. it would, it was in profoundly embarrassing for him when he flip out like that. And so we would always say, you know, if something would happen, we would either get him away or if he was past the point where I could direct him like that, get everybody else away. Yeah, thank you for that, Emily. I know that, um, I know, um, again, I work with some really incredible professionals, but I know that their goal in those situations was always for safety, to remove kids for safety. Um, and I constantly remind them that the other function of that is just what you said, is that this, this is a person here that we're talking about, that again, if you go back to the very beginning, that didn't do this just to make you mad or to be a bad kid, um, we have to take into consideration their feelings uh, at this particular state and support that privacy and that dignity. So thanks for that reminder. And then we had another comment. Um, my kid seems like he is disenchanted with life. He only wants to do a few things and seems like he is having trouble dealing with any kind of responsibility. Chores, helping people, schoolwork, reading books, self-care. How do we get him to care about these things? I think he does still care. I think that, I think that, um, well, I, obviously I don't know him personally, but what I'm find is I think I get I think it's just this big overwhelming reaction it's almost like shut down and everything because <laughs> I can't figure out how to get anything good to happen uh, across the border I can't recreate what had been a uh, good in my life so it's I guess when I when I hear you rattle off that list I guess I would take it really slow and today which one of those things are we going to tackle for a couple minutes, or which two of those things on the list are we going to tackle? Because then we're not sort of fighting every, and some of them have to get done, right? Some of them yeah, have to get done. You need to wash your hands. I mean, that's that one, that is not, that's one's not negotiable. But can I take a few minutes on another one and then celebrate that? Then just celebrate that. And again, if it's somebody who doesn't like a big reaction, then the celebration might just be a note and not a big, you know, clapping and cheering. Um, it might be a note in that in that praise jar. But the the acknowledgement that you're moving towards that. Yeah, that that's not I know that's not a satisfactory um, question, but I feel like we're going back to really tiny steps and and the fear that I'm hearing from families is that, oh, he's lost all these skills. I don't think that they've lost all the skills. I do think they're having trouble accessing them at this point. So even accessing parts of it that we can check it off the list. Because you know what, if you have a list that nothing ever gets checked off, you have a whole schedule and none of it gets done. That's why I'm liking the we move it, <laughs> we move it as we do it, or as we as we try to do it. I'm going to try to do this one. Oh, I only got three of the dishes done, but look at that. I tried that. That still still stays on there. I know it, it feels like you're, like you're like you're losing ground forever, um, but it, it's probably going back to things you had to do in much smaller steps a very long time ago. And then adding that for for me, I know as an adult with the pandemic. Um, I have had to kind of prioritize some things at home, um, getting that that stress and anxiety sometimes. And um, I kind of organized all the chores and all the, the laundry list of things that I have to do based off of priority. Like if some of the lower priority things didn't get done today, 
that's okay. And I had the, the must-dos and, and the would really be good to get those to get done today things. And then I had the, all right, here, here are the, the nice to haves at the end of the list. And I could set up little rewards for myself. And th that, that's a really nice way to organize it. And this particular um, uh, young man that, 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 that the question was about might be at the point where he could make some of those divisions um, and separations. I'm, I'm not sure some simpler version of that, but that's better than having a whole list that you feel like you didn't accomplish or that you said you were gonna do them all and you didn't get them all done. Then you feel horrible, right? I know and it's, it's not realistic either. It's just not realistic. There is such a thing as a cold brain, I think. You know, I just don't think we are in the place, any of us are in the place where we can do things at the same rate. Um, uh, efficiency, um, boy, I don't know anybody who can. Um, and I know that it may or may not help for some individuals, but uh, I have a personal little cheat that I do with some of my task lists, which is, I break larger tasks into tiny little things. So I mentally, if I'm doing the dishes, I'll just take a look at the dishes and be like, I have 15 dishes. And I go, one, two, three. And so I got 15 things done today. <laughs> and I just add it. And so it's like, it's like padding your score a little bit for the day. Oh, I love that. My husband's going to love that because he told me yesterday he did 22 dishes. <laughs> and I said, did you really count them? It helps. That I think I did, because <laughs> I know I did 22. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it's just another way to fr reframe it, right? Which is what <laughs> we've really been talking a lot about. Um, and there's things yeah. like, um, I see reading books is here instead of finishing one book. Uh, I don't know what level they re what level he reads at, but it could be a paragraph or a, a sentence or a page um chapters uh you just or sit with me and i'll read some of it to you mm -hmm. we still read <laughs> yeah even though you know how to read it yourself that's not that maybe not the way you can concentrate right now yeah it, it's requiring a lot of flexibility on on our part to kind of re um, reorganize and reframe um a lot of these uh expectations so, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, are there any other questions? We're up against the hour. I don't know. Um, okay. Do we have any more slides on this or? Nope, I think that was nope. the last one. Wow, um, yeah. perfect timing. Okay. So I got us, got us into, well, a little bit past the hour. Um, yeah, that's fine. So just... Thank you. Thank you very much for um, attending and um, uh, asking some questions and sharing. Uh, and hopefully you left with a little, um, a little a more a little a different way to think about some of the things that you're that you're experiencing um so thank you for coming and take good care yeah thank, thank you, you mary me. and for everybody else it, we do not yet have something scheduled for the uh 23rd or 30th uh, we will the autism society will send out a blast our next scheduled session will be on 8 6 connecting with your child um but you can go to the um, autism societies Facebook page to figure that out and then the emails will come out. Thanks again, Mary. It was great. Um, yeah, nice to, yeah, virtually. Virtually. <laughs> nice to meet you virtually. Nice to meet you virtually. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, wait. My husband says the menu board is a scrum board, which is used in business organizations. Ah, he's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yep. And uh, there's. I've worked with a scrum as is, is used with a lot of uh, coding and, and business development teams and uh, having that that list of things to do right there. Uh, it's a it's a really good system to put in place.